welcome Lindsay's parents. No, no, notice there's been a shift. It's no longer, it's no longer Paul and Sharon and their, their daughter, Lindsay. It is now Lindsay's parents. But we welcome you. <laughs> There you go. And Kim is on there, I think. <clears throat> it's good to have you folks with us. God bless you. Okay, if we, we're uh, um, in uh, Redemption Truths, this is the last, this night is the last night, two classes. This first one from seven to eight, and the la last one will be from eight to nine. We want to talk about resurrection as related to kind of uh, kind in relationship to the things that we talked about in Genesis. Um, Adam did not have one after his kind, and when Adam and Eve sinned, then God didn't have one after his kind. And that whole emphasis uh, that we've been doing, and these are going to be our last two sessions in relationship to that, but. You know, since God has this uh, father tendency, God, Almighty God, has a father tendency uh, in such a manner that everything he does sort of leans toward imparting himself um, to those who will, I'm going to say it like this, to those who will act toward him as sons. And here's what I mean. Here's what I mean. <clears throat> those who will fit with the Father in relationship to being made after his kind, who will be fathered into his image, who will be not just birthed, not just birthed into this now. Because you're not, you know, there are, there are children born to some parents that are the exact opposite of their parents, you know. Um, you know, so much so that a parent could say, I love my, my son, but I really don't like him. Or my daughter. Or my daughter. And uh, <laughs> um, because you know, they never really came into the family spirit. And they kind of went out into the world and they picked up something else. And um, in relationship to becoming after God's kind, <clears throat> there has to be a participation. Especially true in, in spiritual things and in um, the reality of what God is seeking not just born again warm bodies. I mean, that's good. I mean, if you're born again, you're saved from hell, that's good for you. It's not necessarily good for the Father. See, I mean, just where our emphasis is. And, and um, so when the Father wants to bring somebody into his kind, he works through one primary avenue without fail it is the avenue of death and resurrection always always and you, you get you get the example I mean we, we talked about this in one of our first classes that we started dealing with this in relationship to kind Adam and Eve in the garden or, or uh, in the book of Genesis and <clears throat> Adam's looking around and he can't find anyone after his kind and all the other animals have, have one after their kind but he can't find anyone after his kind and God says it's not good that man should not have one after his kind. It's not good that man should be what God describes as alone. That's, you know, that's a powerful word. Anybody ever felt alone? Well, you know, God was understanding this because he had thrown creation into existence, made everything, made the material world, and then set about making different kinds and showing to, to 
his main creation, man, the, the condition that God felt because there was none after his kind. And, and, and as I said, the father having this fatherly, this father tendency to want to, to impart himself, not just do good deeds, save people, bless people, but impart himself. That's why you call him father. He could still be God and save and bless. I mean, you know, and Jesus comes and Jesus primarily calls him father, you know, because he is the great imparter. And so, so, he's, so he, he, he makes all this creation. He does all this stuff. And then he, he puts Adam in the garden and then he doesn't immediately bring one of his kind about. And he gives Adam the feel of what God must feel. God could say of himself. In the Garden of Eden, it is not good that God be alone. It, it, that's what he said about him. It's not good that he should be alone. He doesn't have one after his kind. Well, neither did, did God in that sense. <clears throat> you say, well, Jesus, I'm talking about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one after his kind. And so <clears throat> what does God do? How does he bring this about? Well, he just, you know, he, he could go, okay, hey, I created everything. I created a lion and a lioness, and I think I'm just going to go poof and make a one after his kind. But when it comes to God and when it comes to that which is on his heart, he doesn't want to just poof magic or poof miracle, not those things. I mean, you know. You go all the way back to, to um, Israel in Egypt under bondage to Pharaoh and, and uh, no, uh, Moses comes before Pharaoh and he does a miracle and he does another miracle and he does another miracle and does another miracle and he does nine miracles and still doesn't bring about what he wants. And so then he just kills a lamb and bingo, death. And then here they come out in resurrection. Okay. My son have I called out of Egypt, the scriptures tell us. My son. No, no, I thought it was Israel. No, no. For God, he was seeing kind because a death and now a crossing of the Red Sea, a resurrection has taken place. <clears throat> All right. So, um, so we see over here in uh, Luke chapter 15, if you'll turn there with me. <clears throat> the situation here is that Jesus tells three quote unquote parables or stories. But what precipitated it was, was Jesus was hanging out with people that were hungry to hear him and to be with him and to be close to him. And the Pharisees were standing afar off and accusing and going, doesn't he know what kind he's with? But they're demonstrating that desire for impartation, that desire for closeness, that desire for something to, to bring about change for them. And the Pharisees are not. They're just sitting and judging. And they think they're judging kind. They're going, well, we're one kind. We're the Pharisees, and we're one kind. We're the good guys. Have you ever noticed how we're always the good guys? You know, and they're the bad guys. Have you ever noticed that they are always the bad guys? <laughs> funny, funny how that works. All right, so, you know, it, so, so Jesus begins to tell these stories, and one of the stories he tells is the, the, what's called the parable of the prodigal son. And uh, verse 11, and he said, a certain man had two sons. All right. So here we have it drawn on the board, the father and two sons. Now, let me just ask you straight out at, at this 
point in the story, at this point, a certain man had two sons. Which of the two sons is actually his kind? The prodigal or the elder son? Very good. Neither one are at this kind. Wait a minute, though. Aren't they, he said they had two sons. Aren't they born into the family? Aren't they born again? Yes. They're both born again. Born into the family. And he's called father. And they're called family, if you will. Okay. But while they are both very, very different, they are not either one of them or after his kind. And so this brings up a dilemma to our minds, just like what happened with the Pharisees who were, who, let's just say that the Pharisees had been taught about kind, a different kind. There's, you know, this kind and that kind and whatever. And let's say they've been taught about it and they said, we're, the kind, we're God's kind when they weren't. In fact, they had him crucified. And pointing to them over there and saying, they couldn't possibly be of his kind. They're the wrong kind. And look who he's hanging out with, the wrong kind of people. But what if Jesus actually doesn't judge as much as we think by the outward and by the failures as much as by the heart? What if man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart? And he can discern a goat. Remember, we talked about that in one of our other classes. Over here is the sheep, and there over here is the goat, or over here and there. And, and, the, uh, uh, and he just, you know, they're gathered before him of all nations, and he simply divides them in two different kinds. And, then, you know, I'm sure one of them's going, what am I doing over here with the goats, man? I was just like one of these Pharisees who was accusing and saying, that, you know, Jesus, what are you doing? And... And all this goes, and you know, Jesus discerns kind. Okay. So, your response was neither one of these sons are yet his kind. All right. So, so what do we have here? What do we have then? Well, we have. Uh, the prodigal son who is rebellious and is primarily thinking about himself. He wants to get some good stuff and he wants to be on his own and he wants this and he wants that, but it's all pointed inward to himself. But you have the elder son who never left the father, who never did anything wrong, who never, and he is trying to please the father religiously not ba based on being, you know, that you might be to the praise of his glory. He didn't say do praise and glory. He said that you might be. You know, be holy for I am holy. He didn't say do holy. We just talked about this, you know. I mean, those are important points. I mean, there are, there are points of being, and yet we read right over them and we see doing. Guess who else did that? The elder son. He sees it in terms of doing stuff that will please God, and he thinks that's what it's all about. Well, folks, that's the law. That's the old covenant. All right. But one after his kind will do more being than doing. A little confusing there, but nonetheless, I think you get what I said. <laughs> That you, your, your doing comes from your being more than your doing comes from just thinking through, trying to figure out what's, here we go, right or wrong. What's another way of saying that? Good or evil, wrong tree. Pardon? Christ our flesh. <clears throat> Absolutely. Absolutely. That's right. All right. So, um, so there is this um, <clears throat> dilemma that the Pharisees are in because they have, they have been given wrong definitions of God's reality. Yes. You know, and um, 
The way out of that is not to get right definitions from somebody else. The way out of that is to see the Lord, you know, and the scripture is saying, when the, veil is, when the heart turns to the Lord, the veil is rent, and we see him face to face, and we're changed into that same image. That's a, that's a kind change. You're being changed into another kind. Do you agree with that? I mean, this is, and folks, how do you get to the holy of holies without being born again or in the family of God? You know what I mean? I mean, you've already, you're already in, just like these sons were in the family, but they, neither one of them were, the, were of that kind. Yes. Sure. Sure. Well, you know, that's true, but, you know, we, there's a million, you know, what, eight billion people on the planet. There's eight billion scenarios for everybody's personal life. There's only one path to kind, and that is through that veil. And there, what is required is to see him and in seeing him, not, not see about him, but in seeing him to be changed into the same kind that he is. And that doesn't discount what you said, because that's, I know all about that. You know, some of the stuff that, you know, when you're raised in an orphanage and all this kind of stuff. But ultimately, you know, I, I can see sheep and goats, and I can see, I can see goats, uh, you know, going, what do we, just like, I mean, we didn't read it, but here, uh, uh, chapter 15, verse 1, then drew nigh unto him all of the tax collectors and sinners to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. There is, it's like, what is this going on? Why are they drawing close to Jesus? You know, and why, what's going, you know, they're, they're confused and they're, um, because they may be seeking, you know what the next, you know what the next parable is after the uh, first one about the lost sheep? The coin. And the coin is a situation where you can lose a coin in a room that's not really all that. You can lose it really bad if you drop it and it rolls off into that corner and you spend all your time over here searching for it. A lot of Christians <laughs> are not looking in the right place. <laughs> so I didn't put that, by the way, I didn't put that one in there next just before the prodigal son. The Lord did that. And <clears throat> yeah, amen. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, so in this story, you, you, you're familiar with it. We're not going to read the whole thing, but let me see if we can. Um, verse 28, and this is talking about the elder son. He was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And let's see. He says all this stuff. And then verse 31, and the father says, and he said unto him, son, and guess what that word son actually is? It's child. It's not the word son. It's child. He's, he, he's dealing with him because he's a child, throwing a little fit out here. Thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Meaning he's having to deal with the issue of what he got as opposed to what the elder son wanted and didn't get. It's about what you get. I was good, I should get. You know, grace flies in the face of a whole lot of people who earn, you know. They, you know, in fact, that, that's their motto. Earn or burn. <laughs> yeah. Look at the next verse. Verse 32, it was fitting that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. So here he goes. In the old kind, 
he was dead. In the new kind, he's resurrected. Death and resurrection. You just dig around, you know, it's kind of like a little, anytime you're in the scriptures and you find a little place where it feels like something might grow there, dig around a little bit and you'll see death and resurrection, especially if he's going to be bringing about his kind. <clears throat> all right. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and God's answer was to bring them down into death, but bring them up into new life. New life. Okay. So, um, I wrote, the elder son found out that oneness as a doctrine has no power. <laughs> oneness as a doctrine has absolutely no power. How frustrating is it, people, to, you know, watch the younger son go out and do all this stuff and you hold down the fort and all this stuff but you're holding the doctrines of the truth and you've never entered into the veil. You've never been brought into oneness either. So this other radical son comes back and the father responds. He sees him from a great way off and he begins to move toward him. And he not only moves toward him, but he seeks to um, set him as his prized son, as Christ, but to impart. So... This is, this is the purpose of the ring and the kiss and the robe and the shoes and all of this stuff. It is impartation of the Father as declaration of Son, of being made after His kind. And He's treating Him like He never did anything wrong. In fact, He's treating Him like He was dead and now He's alive. Because that's the way God looks at it. He looks at it like he came up out of that death. And now he's dressing him in the reality of the father's heart and the father's eyes. He's, he's putting that on the son. All right, so um, it, it is supposed to be a relationship of man to the cross and to God as life. Uh, to the cross, to get rid of one kind, to the resurrection, to the God, to be the life, to be the life of the believer. It is a relationship which has to be personally entered into and only exists where it has been personally entered into by both sides. Participation, participation. We're not talking about a covenant relationship, we're talking about a participation of kind. That could well have been read that way, like a covenant relationship, like it is in many, many places. And all we come away with is, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I made a deal with God. You know, I mean, God said to me, deal or no deal. And I said, deal. But after you make that deal, you go off and you're not any different. You're still greedy and you still want to go for <laughs> bigger Never watched the show in my life. Just seen commercials. <laughs> and, uh, all right. So if, if this participation of kind is not entered into, um, by, if somebody fails to do it, you see what I'm saying? There's, there's two. There's God and there's us. And if we fail to enter into that, then it's nothing, it's just him. Well, you say, no, but there's people standing around talking to him about religious stuff. <laughs> but he's not wanting that. He's wanting union. He's wanting oneness. He's wanting participation, not, when I say participation, I'm not talking about, well, you're a, you're a lazy church. All you do is sit there in your pews while I preach and lead the worship and do everything. We need some people to start participating. No. First of all, we don't have that problem. <laughs> and second of all, the... Yeah. 
And second of all, our participation, folks, is in, in Christ, into Christ, into Christ. Even the word believe and the word faith, believe into Christ. Look it up. It's there. It's the exact Greek word. It is never to just believe at it. I'm believing at you. You know. And I, pardon? I believe about it. Well, the reason why I said at him is I, it's like a, you know, I don't know, a, a tomato. and I hit him. My faith hit him. I believe at him. You know? I don't know. My mind's weird. <laughs> Would you say that was much more spiritual? Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So, so Jesus comes along, and it's getting towards the end now in John 14, and he comes along, and he's trying to talk to his disciples. And he's trying to prepare them for a radical change, okay? A radical change. They've been used to having him with. They've been used to him right there, and they go, hey, Lord, do that for me. Hey, Lord, da-da-da-da. You know what I mean? Lord, come over here, you know. Lord, why don't you go minister to those people? Well, we're his body now. He's preparing them. You're going to be my body. You're not going to be the one I'm ministering to. You're going to be the ones I'm ministering through. Now, you, obviously, we get ministered to also, but Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. I wonder what he meant by that. Well, that's his spirit, and that's his way. And, that's, and if we're going to be his bride, if we're going to be his body, if we're going to be his vehicle, he's going to use that to minister to others more than, than to you. You know. I mean, you've heard me tell it a long, long time ago. I said, oh, Lord, you got to come to me and come and minister to me. And he said, you know, you're my feet. I need, to, I need to be in you and use you to go where I want to go. And, and that uh, in no way circumvents that God will minister to you and loves you and, you know, I'll minister to you and all that. But there is a reality of the heart of God that we tend to miss, and I don't want to miss anything pertaining to the heart of God. I don't want to make excuses. I don't want to put myself first and say it's okay during this period because this or that or whatever, and, you know, and I have a good reason. I don't want a good reason. I want the Lord. And I believe that if you just keep pressing and hungering and, uh, you know, that he'll open his heart to you more and more. But if he just sees you grab his stuff and, you know, that's what he said, don't cast your pearls before swine. They'll grab it up and they'll turn around and rend you with it. I mean, these are the words of Jesus. I'm not, you know, I'm nobody. I'm a little podunk little church in a little town. I'm nobody. But if that's Jesus and that's his heart, then that's the kind we're supposed to be, then we need to get on board with Jesus. You know, and that's, that's between everybody individually as you seek the Lord. All right. So Jesus comes along in John 14, and it's, it's almost over with now. It's the last week, the last week of his existence. And... He's trying to talk to disciples to eventually bring them forth as the body of Christ the, after his kind. You know, there's different terms. Body of Christ, bride of Christ, sons of God. All of that relates to being and kind and participation. None of that is just a title or something he hits you with and you walk off with and go, okay, I got this title and I'm, I'm important, you know. That's not the way he operates. He doesn't do it that way. So Jesus comes along and he says, okay, look, I'm trying to explain some things. And, you know, it's in, uh, that, that's 14, the next chapter. Uh, well, here he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Well, in chapter 15, he says, I'm the true vine, you're the branches. All of this is starting to, you know what I mean? I mean, he's starting to get to us now before he leaves He's not saying what I thought he was going to say. I thought he came here to fix everything and to work and do all this good stuff and make everything wonderful and bless me and set up a kingdom and do all this stuff. And he's acting like he's going to go away and they're going to kill him and that he's just talking about, look, I want you to be after my kind. I, I would, 
you know, I'm going to go down into death, and there's going to be a resurrection, and you're going to be after my kind. You remember the Adam story, people? You know, it's kind of, you know, you're Jews. Y'all don't remember that story? <laughs> you know, right at the very beginning, before there was sin or serpents or anything, you know, that was really what was working in me before you guys really messed up royally <laughs> and got it off from the real deal. But now you're going to be saved and be able to get on track. All right. So uh, here he doesn't declare himself to be uh, the one who resurrects, but as the actual resurrection itself and the life after resurrection. I am the resurrection, and I'm the life after resurrection. All right. All right. So uh, we're, you know, I don't want to, just don't want to miss anything here, so, so I'm just going to, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 36 starts talking about, he says, Thou fool, I, don't you know that unless something dies, there can be no life. There's not going to be any quickening, any life in you. There's just going to be duty and law as you learned it before. Right. And... Uh, and of course, as we know, therefore he's saying, if you want to be part of the new kind, you have to be part of the resurrection. Amen? Ah, but if you're going to be part of the resurrection, you have to be part of the death. <laughs> he sneaks up on you, doesn't he? And he tells it like it is because it's absolutely the truth. Okay. So um, I wrote down here, uh, today, there can be no resurrection unless you find a dead person. Because if I'd have said it the same way I said it for the last 40 years, you'd have just gone, yeah, I know it. There, you, what you need to do is start digging around in you and find a dead person. All right? <clears throat> and then in big letters I put, you need to find a dead person. Because there can't be a resurrection without it. You need to find the body. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> However, the thing many Christians miss is who died and who is raised. Okay? Right? Who died and who is raised. Okay, so let's take it this, the easy version first. Jesus died and Jesus was raised. Amen? You didn't expect me to go there, did you? But you know what? He did die, and he was raised, and we only participate. See? Participate. That's the whole goal. That's the whole thing. That's the, you know, the thing that is going to make a difference. Um, what is it? He says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? How? God forbid. How? And the actual Greek there is, how is it possible? Because it says, know ye not that as many as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death because they're, he's after kind. He's not just trying to fix sin. Yes, he fixed sin, but there's something greater that he wanted. You wanted him to fix sin. He wanted something else. We stop and we say, okay, I'm saved. That's it. Forget it. Now bless me. But he wants. So know ye not, Paul knows this. He's, he's, the, he's an apostle of God. He's a man with a message from God. Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. And they says, like as we were buried by baptism into death, we were raised unto newness of life. In the Spanish and most other Bibles, it says new life. The Greek, new life. Not newness. Oh, oh, I feel new. Well, stop it because you're not. You're either dead or it's Christ. <laughs> That's right. Keep looking for the body, okay? The dead person. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, so we're talking about that death and that resurrection. We must not embrace these terms theologically but in a participatory manner. 
Oh, you know, what a, what a danger that we live in to hear these things and to just say they're doctrines and I believe this, you know, this set of doctrines. And because I believe that set of doctrines, I'm saved and I'm okay and God's really happy with me. We're not supposed to be believing in doctrines. We're supposed to believe in, believe in him and the reality of him. And that, again, is not theological, but it's based on participation into him as a different kind. Okay? All right. Um, we can go to this one, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if you're wondering why I'm hurrying a little bit, it's because it's my last two classes. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15. Now, that, now we, we dealt with this verse uh, much earlier in other classes, but I want to read it again. Verse 22. Because <clears throat> there's some very important things stressed here. Verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Okay. Several really important things to God. Really important. It's not just a verse, for God's sake. It's, I mean, I, you know, maybe I'm just too passionate about it, but I, I feel the heart of God screaming out of this where, you know, hear my heart. Don't just read a theological statement or... or just read it and get nothing out of it. And, and those, one of the things there is he's really speaking of kind just as he did in Genesis before the fall of being after his kind, that that's what I want, that that's what I'm interested in, that that's why I did all of this, that that's what's in my heart, whether you search through the scriptures and see it through the the reality of a bride or you search through the scriptures and you find it in the reality of being sons of God to the father or you search through the scriptures and you the God reveals you to you the the reality of the being the body of Christ or you search through and you find out what being a vessel or a branch is all of that is to bring you into oneness with him in such a way that you will change kinds not that you will change But you will change kind. You will, you will, you won't just please God because you're a different kind and you do everything right. You'll please God because you're the kind that He wants. The dream of every girl. I am the kind that that man wanted. I am it. I'm the only one. Good luck with that in our society, but nonetheless. <laughs> All right. But we, we, also, we also see death and resurrection here. For as in Adam all die, and Christ also be made alive. There it is again, the subject of kind, and, and that which is uh, um, the wrong kind, death. That which is the right kind, resurrection. Okay? And so one of the really amazing things that you begin to see here is judgment. And you see, you see an explanation of all that we've considered the judgment. Not that that's not it, but I'm just trying to paint a picture for you. You see the reality behind all pictures of judgment, whether it be, you know, the judgment seat of Christ to the prophets to <clears throat> you see in most simple, beautiful form God's definition of judgment. And it's just, it's just to me it's beautiful and it's powerful. 
uh, I wrote the Genesis account before the fall began with judgment. It, the, that era there from Genesis 1 to before the fall, it swallowed up of judgment. This is judgment, judgment, judgment. But you say that to your nominal Christian, they're going to go, well, God ain't smiting people dead and doing this and da da da. What are you talking about? Because they're using, they're using the result of judgment as their definition instead of what God considers judgment. Okay? Just think about it. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to like it. But if you're a student here, you have to listen. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> All right. So um, judgment consists of, here it is, judgment consists of discrimination, differentiation, and separation. Judgment consists of discrimination, differentiation, and of separation. That's what judgment is. You, you do it all the time. Some of you, if you're awake enough, when you go get your coffee in the morning, you open your shelf and you, you decide which coffee cup you're going to make. It's a judgment. That's right. Um, it, it does this in relationship to contrary or distinct things. Judgment. You're making a judgment, although it's not the kind of judgment you think judgment is. But what you think judgment is is a small portion of the greater picture of what judgment is. A discrimination, a differentiation of kind. That's all it is. Well, and, and as I said, in some cases, it's contrary kinds or distinct kinds. But it is still making the right judgment of what that is. Are you following me? Is this, I hope, hope this, is, this is clear. All right, so I wrote... God differentiated between, we're talking about Genesis now, before the fall, all the judgment that went on. Okay, well, here it is. God differentiated between the light and darkness and separated them. Between the evening and the morning, between the earth and the firmament, between flying things and creeping things, between male and female. And I just jotted down a few off the top of my head when I put that down there. Do you see that there was judgment going on left and right? He was, he was, you know, he was going, okay, male and female. So that's a judgment, but that's not a differentiation or a dividing, but it's a separating unto, and it, what was the other word I used? Um, well, that was it. Separation unto kind. And the evening and the morning, well, that's different. And the light and the darkness, he's making judgments of what kind is what kind constantly. I mean, that was all he's doing. Can you see that? I mean, he was just like, bloom, 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 bloom. But if you don't understand judgment, or, or let's put it like this, you're definite, you know what? <laughs> Sorry, I can do this. Do you know what Genesis means, the word Genesis? Beginnings, Beginnings okay. If you go to the book of Revelation, you'll get another definition of judgment. You need to go back to the beginning to find it. Don't go to the end. The end is a manifestation of that in, in uh, um, separation. And it's still differentiation and, and, and uh, that sort of thing. But all, the, all you see there, if you look with your eyes, all you see is what you term judgment, which is bad stuff coming on you. And that's not the true definition of judgment. <laughs> the true definition of judgment is up here in the very beginning, before there was anything needing to be judged as you understand it in the book of Revelation. And yet God's judging between this and this and separating this and then adding these two over here together. And he, he's working with kind all over the place. He's, he's bringing forth the judgment. All right, well, if nothing else, if you understand that, it'll sure take a little edge off of your fear of judgment, you know, <laughs> because that's all it is. In God's heart, he's not, you know, I mean, we, we do, and we, we emphasize so much the wrath of God against sin, and there's no question about it. I'm not, I don't belittle that, but I got news for you. 
Sin, and as we usually say that, is sins, and you're just talking about fruit, the wrath of God against fruit. Well, that would be dumb. God's a little deeper than that, isn't he? I mean, isn't he a little deeper? He just goes, I don't like your fruit. I don't like your fruit. So I'm going to, you know what, I'll tell you what, because your fruit hacks me off. How about, how about this? Hell for all eternity, eternal torment. Really? <laughs> you know? I think, it's a, I think it's a situation of kind. That Jesus died to bring about a certain kind so that nobody would ever have to be outside of that kind. And anybody that is not, they're just, there's just a division of judgment that has to happen. Okay, you're not of this kind. You go over here and this is the, the thing. He doesn't have to be angry anymore. You understand? I mean, he doesn't. He doesn't have to be, you know, he doesn't have to go, yeah, get over there and burn. Make me happy by burning forever. He just goes, you're not my kind. I think he'd probably be every bit as sad as he would angry. Especially if it's been provided by Christ. Yes. A little louder. But what you have to remember is that the judgment isn't just, well, you know, you brought this judgment upon yourself. The judgment was you're of this, you're not of the right kind, which is just a differentiation. It's not a judgment as we call it. It's like a judgment call. We call it a judgment. Yeah, but it's the actual judgment, and the other is the result of true judgment. It's the results of it. So somebody will end up in hell. But that's not really the judgment of God. I mean, okay. Think about this. You know, I'm just trying to make you think about it. You know, I'm not saying I'm perfect in everything and whatever. But, I mean, you know, let us reason together. It, there, it talks about the great white throne judgment, right? It talks about the judgment seat of Christ, right? What, what is that? The, he's saying that that's the judgment instead of hell. Then say, you're going to the great judgment, hell. It says you go to the great white throne judgment, or you go into the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment is there when the kinds are being divided up. Differentiation. Separation. Um, what was the other one? I, discrimination. Thank you. Did, does that make sense? I mean, why would they call that... That place, judgment, that's not, you know, that would be like, okay, here's, if we go with the old definition of judgment, then when a child does something wrong and mama says, okay, I'm tired of dealing with this, I'm going to let your daddy deal with this. When he gets home, it's going to be bad. All right, so... So you come home, and Daddy goes, what's going on here? What did you do? What did you, you do? What, da, 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 and all this kind of stuff. And then from that, he says, well, I'm going to spank you, okay, for those of you who <laughs> are still okay with that. <clears throat> Remember, this is just a parable. <clears throat> uh, so he says, I'm going to spank you. So, so he spanks him. He spanks him. And that would be the judgment. No. No. The judgment was made when he heard the case. And he says, this is what kind you are. And this is what happens to that kind. Does this make sense? I mean, why would, again, why would you call it the great white throne, throne judgment? If the judgment was hell over here forever, you go, well, look, I'll stand here all day at the great, you know what I mean? Or the, you know, 
judgment. I'll, I'll stand here all day. Just don't send me over here. I'm under judgment. Hit me with it. But the judgment that's going on is you're being seen for what you've always been, yeah. sheep or goat, different kind or, uh, or kind. You see, did I see somebody's hand? Is that? Yes. That's a good example. Prison. You go, you stand before a judge, and he makes the judgment of what kind you are based on the facts, and he says, okay, well, you know what? You can go free. Or, you know, and whatever, if you're of the wrong kind, then you go to prison. But prison isn't the judgment. The judgment was made when it came time to figure out what kind you were. All right? So, we could say that judgment is the separation of kinds. All right, so I, I thought that was pretty snappy there. Nobody wrote it down, but <laughs> because in reality, judgment is the separation of kinds. That's all it is. And every, I mean, we, we talk about prison. We talk about, you know, kids facing daddy when he gets home. We talk about the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment. In every case, in every case, it's a judgment of kind. <clears throat> all right. So, in light of that, let's read 1 Corinthians 15.22, the one we read just a few minutes ago. As, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And I remember I said, that there are important things here to God and to his heart and to the way that he sees and the way he views things, you know. Folks, when the Bible says his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our ways, you can pretty much bank on that. Okay. But if you're born again, you can be of another kind. You can have the mind of Christ. And you do have it, but you may not be accessing it. You know what I mean? Two important things, or three, that in this verse, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all, there is a separation of kind, okay? But there's also the great separator of kind, death and resurrection. And there's also the judgment where discrimination of kind comes about, where dis differentiation of kind comes about, and ultimately, well, where is, was, and is, and will be, ultimately, separation will come about. Because, I mean, I, I'm just telling you, if somebody's of another kind, they're already separated from God. Even if they're, even if they're the prodigal son or the elder, I'm not saying they're going to hell I, I, that's not even an issue to me right now. The, I mean, if you know, if you knew that the issue was what kind you were, why would you sit there and then worry? Well, do you think I'm gonna go to heaven or hell? I mean, why don't you get after being the right kind? I'm just, I'm just giving you my weird angle on stuff. <clears throat> All right, so, so here in this verse, we see the judgment. No throne. No hell, you know, no heaven, no, and yet here's the judgment. The judgment is separation of kinds. All right, let me see if probably should stop here. I'll just read this last sentence. Our particip participation with Christ in his death was the putting away of the old kind. The cross actually is the great divider, the great discriminator, the great separator. The cross is where all of this took place. And now it's just those that will pursue him through his means or will pursue him through um, elder son.
you know. All right, let's take a break. We'll come back.